Okay. Good morning, everyone. I hope everybody is doing fine with, uh, or afternoon, or whatever the case may be. Uh, I'm Jim Cressman. Uh, I'm going to be, uh, again, hosting the Zoom meeting today, and we've got two special guests for us today to uh, help us out. Uh, uh, Jane Ann Schrader and Dustin Hoisington, both of which are from the uh, Veterans Administration Veterans Health Care System. Not, don't, don't uh, talk to them about any claims or anything because they don't do that. Uh, but they do help us out with um, all of our uh, durable medical equipment. And they have helped me uh, just obtain a, uh, a new wheelchair. And uh, they're here to, uh, to help us understand a little bit more about what we can expect from the VA hospitals and what the, uh, what the equipment that they have available for us. There's a lot of programs out there that I learned have, have been available to us. And uh, uh, these are going to be helpful to every one of us uh, with IBM uh, that, uh, or, or perhaps PM or DM that uh, are, uh, are uh, you know, the service connected for us veterans. Um, uh, Jane and Dustin, uh, uh, if you would please uh, unmute yourselves here. We'll open the floor to you, and uh, uh, Jane has uh, uh, been with the VA for, uh, what, seven years now, Jane? Uh, actually, I've been with the VA for uh, almost 12, but I started off in the pharmacy, and then I moved over to prosthetics. Okay, and Dustin, you've been there for most of your life, I understand now. <laughs> most of it. Uh, after I got out of the Navy, I, I went pretty much did some odd jobs because the job market was bad and then went to the VA in 2011. So I've been in the prosthetics department since 2011. Okay. Well, thank you both for your help. Um, uh, Dustin or Jane, whoever uh, you, you wish to uh, lead, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the department you work in and, and kind of what it is that you provide for veterans? Okay. I don't know. You want me to go ahead with that, Jane? Please. I've got yeah, it Justin, down. Please. All right. <laughs> so the prosthetic sensory aid service is uh, a lot more than limbs. Obviously, people, when they hear about us, they think it's all just limbs and things. But we actually provide any kind of equipment that supports or replaces a body part or function. So all of you wearing eyeglasses, those are provided by prosthetics. If, if you get them through prosthetics, we provide hearing aids. We provide, of course, all the durable medical equipment that's used at the home, not in the clinic. Um, we provide power mobility devices, auto adaptive equipment. We do home improvement, structural alterations to, for access to the home. We also, you know, will pretty much work any other issue you have that requires some form of adaptive equipment to help you accomplish a daily activity that's part of your treatment plan. That, that's kind of our one requirement. It has to be a direct and active component of your treatment plan and then like I said, it supports and replaces a, supports or replaces a body part or function. So that's kind of our bread and butter at the highest level, you know. And when when a when a veteran needs these services or 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 these this this equipment, um, obviously it is something that they are required to have a prescription from their primary care physician within the VA system. Is that correct? Yes, and it, it may not always be a prescription from the primary care. They're always the starting point. Um, they may refer you to someone who specializes in a certain device. So if you're looking for pain management, obviously your primary care team should be referring you to some kind of pain management clinic. And then some specialist in that field would determine which device best works for you. If it's a wheelchair the primary care is not going to custom design you a chair, but they will write a referral to get you seen by a PT or an OT or someone who specializes in those chairs. And then they will write the actual prescription to prosthetics. So it's like a, almost like two prescriptions. You get the referral prescription for the visits and then a prescription from that comes to prosthetics. But there are some devices that primary care can request. So, Which uh, I, will, I will share with everybody that... Uh... Uh, Jane, uh, 
uh, was helpful in just getting my new wheelchair here, which I'm using as we speak. And I'll tilt my screen down here to to share with everybody here. This this is my new uh, my new. We can't see much of it, but mm. believe me, it helps. It uh, I've been in a rollator for three years, and the uh, it was time for a wheelchair, so I went to my PCP at the VA and explained to him about our our myositis that mm -hmm. you know the. They were, he was going to get me a conventional wheelchair. And I explained to him, I can't, uh, number one, I wouldn't be able to get out of the wheelchair. And number two, I wouldn't, my hands don't close firmly enough to roll the wheels. Mm -hmm. So he uh, uh, he arranged for me to have a, a motorized wheelchair, which has uh, been phenomenal. And Jane uh, helped me. Uh, Dustin and Jane are in the, uh, uh, they, they service out of the, uh, the Grand Junction VA Hospital in Grand Junction, Colorado, uh, where where uh, where I live, and uh, uh, it's been it's been quite quite helpful. A uh, little bit getting used to, but that's the kind of thing that they go through. Um, uh, Jane, uh, what what kind of things can we expect from the VA? And what what are things that uh, you know cannot be provided by the VA? Uh, boy, that, that that's a big question. Yes, it is. I, <laughs> I, I, I realize that as soon as I said it. Uh, I know that pertaining pertaining to durable medical equipment and uh, the home services. Well, it's it's the goal of of prosthetics and the VA to take care of all of our veterans as best as we possibly can, and. Um, it doesn't matter if you're 100% connected or 0% connected, we service all of our veterans. Now, with that being said, there's certain things, there's certain programs that if you're not 100% connected, sometimes you don't qualify for some of those things, but those are, let's talk about that later. Um, but as far as durable medical equipment, is it's the prosthetics response department's responsibility to provide veterans with durable medical equipment that have been prescribed to them from a clinician, whether, whether you're seeing somebody out in the community or within the VA, if they've written that prescription to provide you with that device. And, um, you know, let, let's take your wheelchair example. Um, this is not something that whenever you're going in to see your, your PCP, you're gonna walk out of the hospital the same day with that wheelchair. There is a little bit of a process involved. And so you have to be patient, which is hard. I get it. When you finally get to the point where you, you feel like you need something like that, sometimes it, it does take a little bit more time than you would like. But at the same time, we're we're dealing with a lot of veterans and we're doing the best we can. Um, I know everybody's heard it until they're sick to death, but the supply chain complications are still a doozy, you know, all, all of these companies, whether you're within the VA or, or out in the private sector, we're all challenged with lack of em employees and uh, uh, getting parts and that kind of stuff. So, you know, we, we strive to do the best that we can. But with that being said, when something is ordered, the consult then comes over to the prosthetics department and under our regulations, we have five days to act upon that consult, meaning we need to start action. Sometimes we can't always figure out what the clinician is trying to order and or if it's something that, the v, that, that we can order without having a quote or possibly having the um, veteran be seen in, a, in one of the specialty clinics. Again, I'm going to use your wheelchair, for example. Every now and then we do see uh, one of our PCPs uh, writing a prescription for a veteran stating veteran needs a power wheelchair. Well, we then have to refer it over into the specialty clinic because we, we aren't clinicians. I, I know how to buy power wheelchairs. I do not know how to, to seat you. I don't know how to fit you. I don't know all the bells and whistles that are available out there. So that that can sometimes happen um and then that's it we we start the purchasing process and ultimately uh get the product to the veteran 
Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. One of the okay. follow-up questions that I would have on that is uh, throughout the country, I've spoken to so many veterans and we make comparisons sometimes that we find out that a particular brand of, of uh, <clears throat> whatever product it may be is available at one for one veteran, but yet not for another veteran at a different part of the country. Does the VA healthcare system then, are they on their own to use local providers and manufacturers, or is it a universal setup where the entire VA system depends on one provider? Well, that's, again, yeah. that, that's a big question. Uh, Do you um, want me to reel in on that one? Yeah, yeah, there you so, go. Because <laughs> I deal a lot in contracts. Um, I've yeah. written, I've helped write national contracts, uh, like the RAMP contract, things like that. Um, we do create national contracts. So there will be certain items that are carried across the board, uh, across the VA, just as your basic item. If, if for some reason that basic item does not work for the veteran, um, the example I like to use is something simple like a wrist brace. So every wrist brace fits a little different. So even if you have, just like shoes, if, if it's a different brand, it fits a little different. So if you have, say, a female veteran who, based on the measurements from one manufacturer, the one that we have the national contract from should be in a small, but the therapist puts the device on the veteran and it's too big still because it just runs a little larger and they know this other brand runs tighter, they can justify us to us in their consult that, hey, we know you have a national contract for this brand, but here's the issue we're having with this brand. If they can't justify it, yes, each VA is able to provide on certain items, open market orders. We call them open market. They're non-contracted where we just reach out and say, hey, we need this device. We don't have any here at the local location. And can we do that? But if we have the device on site and it's on contract, it falls on the clinician to say, this device you have on site is not gonna meet the medical needs of that veteran. And then as long as they do that, that gives us the ability to do a waiver pretty much saying we're not gonna use the contracted device. And I'm sorry, Bruce has his hand up. I don't, Bruce, did you have a question? Uh, Bruce, you're gonna to have to unmute yourself there to ask the question, please. Bruce, hit your hit your microphone button. You're uh, you're muted oh, now. There you go. It. I got it now. I do have a question for both of you. I would like at some point during this conversation this day, uh, you guys to touch on acquisition of handicap vehicles and who gets what and how it's a, how it's done. That's all I was. That, okay. that was my question. Yep. And that that is one of our programs. That is a. Uh, if if you don't mind, I can actually touch on that. It's pretty quick. They just recently updated the law. So we are waiting for some guidance down from central office because the, the purchase of handicap accessible vehicles is a grant program that is actually funded through the VBA, the Veterans Benefits Association, not us. Um, we just, we were the middleman. We gather all the documentation and we submit it. We get the prescriptions from your provider. So, um, prosthetics job in that sense is we're kind of the advocate for the veteran. You come to us saying, Hey, this is what I'm looking for. We help you get all that information together and submit it. Currently the law, like I said, it was modified. I believe at the end of December, anyways, I think it was December where they're saying now there's a second grant available uh, to be in the AE program. There are some strict rules. Um, is there a, there is a chat box. Sorry, I'm not as familiar with Zoom as I am with other programs. But what I can do is, um, let me drop this into the chat, see if everyone can see it. I don't know is if that's there, gonna, there you is go. There a, that is the law we follow. I've just put it in the chat. It's uh, the Code of Federal Regulation 17.155. I believe it just got updated. Um, 
So there are limitations for the auto adaptive program. Prosthetics as a service nationwide will ensure veterans will always be able to access their vehicle, meaning we can do anything modification wise to a vehicle you purchased on your own. We would of course ask that you reach out to us first when you're gonna purchase a new vehicle so that we can make sure it will work. And then we can get you and your, your devices into the vehicle. But to be part of the AAE program, there's a lot more rules because usually it's service connected for loss of limbs and you have to be loss of both limbs. And, the, and then if you get accepted into the program, then you're eligible for the grant and hand controls, actual controls to, to operate the vehicle. So that's the difference. Prosthetics will always get a veteran into the vehicle. So like if you go out and buy a van, we may install a ramp, we may raise the floor, or sorry, raise the ceiling, lower the floor, something to get you in and latched in. But we wouldn't be able to do like the full grant for the vehicle unless you're accepted into the AAE program, which is again, ran by the VBA. Does that answer your question, Bruce? Well, it it does to a certain extent, but what is the AE program? That's the uh, Automobile Adaptive Equipment Program. Okay. And um, if if I don't know if you can see it in the chat, I have put the the uh, Code of Federal Regulations that we follow for that. Okay. Um, I saw it. it, it yeah. It, if you pull that up, if you just put that. 38 CFR into like a Google search, it'll take you to the document. It'll show you the criteria needed to be considered eligible for the program. Okay. And Dustin, allow me to ask this. How does one, if, if any of us were, uh, want to make further inquiries to that, would that go through our PCP at the VA hospital? So for the AE program, yes, you'd want to start with PCP and then you would want to get a referral to a driver rehab specialist. So at our facility, obviously we're very small. We happen to have someone who transferred from Denver that is a driver rehab specialist, so they can provide that service. But there are a lot of locations that don't have it. So you may have to get a travel authorization to go to another location to get that prescription written. Okay. So, I see multiple hands raised. I'll, I'll close my okay. mouth. Kevin, uh, you, you've got a question there, Kevin. Uh, can you, there you go. You unmuted. How are you? Aloha. Hey, Jim. Hey, hey, Jim. Good, good. Uh, yeah, Dustin, uh, my question's about, um, um, there's a device called a lift chair, which uh, aids you in standing up when you're, when you can't get up by yourself. And it's not, uh, as far as I've been told, they're not FDA approved devices. They're more pieces of furniture. But for somebody with myositis, where we can't get out of a chair, we need something like that because our only option becomes sit in the bed or stack a bunch of pillows on a chair so we can get out of it. So um, I put in for one, and I was told it's a piece of furniture, and VA won't buy it. But I've also been told there's a special equipment uh, requisition. Um, do you have any experience with buying lift chairs or any advice on how to go forward? Uh, so, I, yes, I do. And I'll tell you, we also deny those requests at our facility because they do, um, per, per national policy, they are considered furniture, but there are alternative adaptive pieces you can buy. Uh, depending on the style of your chair, there are um, blocks that can be placed under it that give it a natural angle. So and raise it so it's easier for you to get in and out. We also offer things depending on your dexterity and your back, uh, like a grab pole that runs ceiling to roof and has a bar that sticks out so you can grab it, turn and get out. There's lots of options. I would recommend you get with an occupational therapy team. So um, we always encourage people to do a home safety evaluation, they're called. So talk to your primary care team, ask for a home safety evaluation. And an occupational therapist will come to your home and they will determine which devices to get you. But our, our OTs are very good about finding other alternatives that work similar, but they are not considered furniture because they're just blocks. They're pieces of equipment that are used with the chair. Because there are also lift devices that can be placed in the chair mm -hmm. that are not considered furniture. Right. So uh, there, there is where there's a will, there's a way. Just mm -hmm. certain things are considered furniture by us. Okay. okay. Yeah. I've got an OT uh, coming up on the 23rd. So I'll, I'll okay. uh, do the yeah. best thing. Jane, there were a, a couple of questions that were submitted previous to the meeting here that I uh, 
would uh, hope you would be able to address. Sure, sure. Let's let's go back to the AAE thing real quick, though. Um, uh, you know, Dustin threw out a whole lot of information for you guys to to ponder, but also be aware that the AAE, the Auto Adaptive Equipment Program, you do need to apply for that. It's an application process. So when you hit that link, you should be able to see the, the application. If for some reason you don't, I can get you an application. You are welcome to apply. I always encourage people to apply. The worst thing they can do is say no. Um, I will forewarn you, it can take anywhere between three and nine months to hear back on a decision. Jane, let me, let me interrupt here for one moment, mm -hmm. if I may. And since we have a representation of disabled veterans from across the country. Uh, could you just provide that to me and I can forward that, that, oh, yeah. that, that application and I can sure. forward that to everybody then? Yeah, absolutely. And then there were some other questions that were submitted to you previously there that if- uh, Sure. Had... Yeah, um, Dustin, let's start going through these. Um, uh, the first one, I, and I'm, I apologize, I'm gonna slaughter some of these words. Uh, uh, the first question was, what are some devices that can be used with IBM vets that have dysphagia? Am I pronouncing that correctly? Dys dysphagia, right. Dysphagia, that is, okay. That's the, that's the inability to swallow. Right, right. Again, Dustin and I, prosthetics, we are not medical clinicians. We can't recommend a product. We can only procure a product. But we can recommend that you get seen by your VA or out in the community by a speech therapist. There are products out there. We just, we don't know everything that's out there because we're, we're not, we don't operate in that individual field. Okay. Yeah. I, so. I can't, I can't tell you, I can't be a commercial like you see on TV for Claritin or some of these, I don't know, heart medications and stuff like that, because I, we are not clinicians. I, you know, I mean, it's crazy enough going back to either your wheelchair, or like that example that, that Dustin gave you, if you have a veteran that comes in and they're, wrist is like this and they say i need a brace we can't just give them one they have to be seen by a clinician and a product has to be ordered um i know there are quite a few devices out there and we even see them coming through uh in our little va from our speech uh, uh therapist and uh they are very well versed on what is available uh, out in the community. And, and further down the list, there was a question regarding like um, electronic uh, equipment to help you be able to communicate with people if you do lose your ability to speak. And yes, there, there are electronic devices out there that uh, are available, but they have to come from one of the clinicians, primarily your speech therapists uh, for that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, Suds, a lot of those questions that were submitted, you, you uh, sent to me, uh, would you want to ask uh, uh, Jane and, and Dustin directly uh, some of the questions that you had? Uh, yes, let me, let me pull those up. Uh, there was another question that was on here from uh, Stephen, I think. He, he wanted to know if the, uh, let me, I can't pull it up. It was in the chat here. Let me go down in the chat. Uh, so it's, we we have, Dustin and I have the list. And, okay. Um, um, we can just kind of take turns, you know, yeah. reading them off yeah. and oh, answering. Be, yeah, that would be great. Would say, I'll, be great. Do, I'll do the next one, Jane. We'll just go back yeah. and forth. That sound good. Yeah. All right. Good. Yeah. I gave you the hard one then. The robots. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right. So uh, hey, like, I didn't know what had... dysphagia was until I got this and saw the speech therapist, right. anyway. So so uh, yeah, and and again. Uh, there were devices to exercise your throat muscles, things like that. Those are all kind of grouped together. Uh, yeah. There are devices for, again, like uh, as you saw with my response about the furniture, I can't say exactly which device because there's multiple versions. But if you have an idea of the device you're looking for, work with your clinical team. Um, for power outages um, that are becoming more frequent, looks like that was one of our questions. Um, yes. And it was about uh, veterans 
that are on ventilators, CPAPs, things like that. So uh, national policy is that prosthetics will provide portable generators for veterans that are on life-sustaining equipment. So uh, you have to get that approved. Once you get approved for a portable generator, it's um, prosthetics and sensory aids responsibility to contact the manufacturer of whichever device you're on that's life-sustaining to find a generator that is compatible and will not fry it or anything like that because it generates too much or doesn't generate enough electricity. Now, the big thing is those are obviously short-term and should not be used to power the whole home. We can actually do whole house generators, ones designed to that are like a permanent generator, not portable, but that is done through our HISA program, which is the home improvement structural alteration. Mm -hmm. And they are, they are not cheap. So it will, it, it will burn through your entire HISA. So obviously if you're able to do a portable, we can buy that ourselves and save you your grant money for your home improvement. So that's locally, that's what we would encourage. We don't struggle with power outages here very often. We actually have several veterans who live off grid. So um, I do know, and this is again, just us keeping our ears to the grindstone. Uh, they are working at modifying that to include like solar panels and solar powered stuff with battery packs, but that has not been signed off yet. Everything has to be signed off at the central office. So uh, currently we can provide portable generators. Uh, you would just need a prescription from your provider stating you're on this life sustaining device and uh, you suffer from frequent power outages. And then we would be able to per procure one for you. Okay. okay. Like, like in our area, we just had a major snowstorm. So I believe the last score of power outages was still over like 150,000 homes. Fortunately, we, wow. we uh, had our power, but you know, that, that's been happening. And it, I know it's been happening more and more frequently throughout the country right now, but just because of, you know, mother nature and what, what yes. she's yes. providing us. So yes. A surprise so, every every storm so yeah and the other thing is um when when they prescribe that to you one of the things prosthetics should be doing again every prosthetics department has a slightly different culture how they how they handle things i know i would encourage my staff to be like okay where is this generator going to be stored because we want to make sure the veteran doesn't unknowingly place it inside the home and you know release all that carbon into the home while they're running it they need to have something outside a way to run that electricity then inside uh and so you may have to use hissa to maybe pour a concrete slab and then place a small shed there just to store it you know but that's one of the things we're going to be looking at on my end if anyone ever asked me for a, a portable generator it would be where are they going to plug it in how are they going to run the power into the device because a portable generator will do you no good if you have no way to get that power from outside the home into the home yeah, that's just like barbecuing inside your house. And, exactly, you know, exactly. You know, but you know, things. we have to we have to think about it because there are people that do crazy, do it. <laughs> crazier yeah. things. I know we've we've, we've seen yeah. that many paper article. Yeah. One, one of the other things with with the generators for most of the IBMers and people that have myositis, we don't have the muscle to lift a generator, or in in our case, um, like I'm. 76 going on 77 and my wife doesn't have the physical ability to lift that so we yeah, probably yeah. would have to use i think you said the hissa which is what the home improvement system to, yeah. to put something more permanently outside the house to, to run run the issue another thing that that's always perplexed me or i'm questioning is when they talk about quote furniture and most of the guys and gals you see in the room here that have IBM, we've all sat in our, our easy chairs or uh, easy boy chairs and stuff like that. And they were good. And then we put a, we ended up putting them on like a pallet to lift them up a little bit higher. But I've even got mine on a pallet that's, you know, two pallets high. And right. now I can't get out of that because of weakness in the quads and everything. And yet it's, it's the, the it's, the VA that is telling us we can't get you any adaptive, quote, furniture. And like in Kevin's case, in the, the lift seat, that, that's an item that picks you up off the floor. People have seen that, you know, and they said, we'll develop this. 
will make this for people that are not only myositis people, but people that have problems getting themselves up off the floor. How often does the VA uh, look at items that are newer or innovative for rare diseases or other diseases that are coming down the line? I mean, it's like, so is it set are, in stone or? No. Or, or? Contracts uh, run historically. Uh, so contracts for devices run historically for five years, but they can be cut off at any time. So it's never set in stone what devices we provide on contract. And again, we are able to do open market as long as it's a direct and active component and is medically justified and falls into categories. We have certain categories. We follow roughly eight different laws. Um, one of the things I did put in the answers, and Jane, and if you have it pulled up, will you drop it in the chat, is the prostatics and sensory aids research and development side. Um, the VA is the largest prosthetics service in the world. And a big part of that is we have several locations that strictly work on research and development. Um, they There is a research and development department, but they work with the prosthetic service to develop new things. And again, to your seat issue, it's it's the fact that it is a full piece of furniture. There are seat lifts, but they sit on the seat and they're a remote control and they'll pick you up. And we do have sit to stand lifts that will assist someone if their caretaker helps them get out of the chair that we can provide at the home. Yes, I've been provided a, a Hoyer lift that'll, that'll pick and up. And the, the Hoyer lift is a standard patient lift, but there are yes. actual sit to stand lifts uh, specifically for chairs and things like that. Um, it's like a hydraulic powered bar pretty much. And okay. it's pretty, pretty handy. But there are actually devices if you were to go like, uh, again, Google seat lift. I can't tell you exactly which ones, but there, okay. there are several. And we have purchased a couple here that when I was purchasing, because mm -hmm. it is pretty much um, a frame. It's pretty much the lift system that's built into the chair. It's just not built into the chair. So it only lifts out of the seat, if okay. that makes sense. So you would set it it's in a, your it's favorite a separate, chair. It's a separate component that you put in your, in your yes. chair. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So, so okay. like I said, it's, it's very important to understand that like we are always trying to look for ways to get to the yes. At least, at least, like I said, every culture is different at every VA. Uh, I feel like our VA, we, we strive to try to get to that yes. So we will try to educate everyone. And that's why we're here today. Um, can, you, but, can you volunteer to become part of the prosthetics department for, as part of the ideas and solutions or ideas in development? So that would, again, for development and things, that actually is ran through research and development. Um, mm -hmm. we, again, the prosthetic century aid service, we are technically an administrative service that is providing purchasing and things like that. So what would happen is I think Ohio has a very, very robust research and development center in Ohio okay. for the VA and they try all the things. So like when, um, when wheelchairs started coming out, the power wheelchairs with the sensors that set around the veteran's head and based on how he moved his head, it would drive the power wheelchair that was developed in Ohio. Um, I think Seattle had a research and development center that was working on the exoskeleton shortly. They did that mm -hmm. for a bit and then they contracted it out because they were like, we don't have enough time and resources to do it, but we want the research to continue. You know, um, so prosthetics is always developing but we do separate it out because we don't we can't manage both your limbs and all the programs that we work with the vba and the research and development because we are a very small department when you go mm -hmm. to any va prosthetics is actually one of the smallest departments so okay. yeah, i visit i visited our uh, prosthetics department a couple of times and they've made repairs on my wheelchair and everything and they're fantastic you know, and nothing yeah. but five stars that's, for you guys. You guys do great, great jobs. So that's great. We appreciate Jane, it. if I if I could ask a favor, and that is we've talked about a, a number of different programs mm -hmm. and opportunities. Would you be kind enough to forward a list of those to me so I can in turn disseminate those to the rest of the veterans here? Because it sure. seems like a lot of programs and things that uh, seem like they're going to be quite helpful for everybody. Yes. Yeah. 
can Thank do. You. That would that would be wonderful. And uh, I'm going to try to read other, uh, uh, other other Jane. Was there other other questions in that list that uh, you wanted to cover? Uh, here here's I think a, a good one. Um, what is the life duration of an electric an electric wheelchair that was issued to us by the VA? We just watched a video on the arterial tilt feature that is now available on a wheelchair that was not available when I received our chair. Um, this this goes along the lines of what we were just talking about. You know, the technology is is really it's coming at us really very fast. And if you should see some kind of new feature that's available on your chair that you would like explored, I would strongly recommend that you reach out to whoever it was. Again, you're probably going to have to start off with your PCP, but get a referral to see that occupational therapist and or, or uh, physical therapist that ordered your wheelchair so they can reevaluate re your medical needs and also with what's available. That might entail a purchase of a new wheelchair or it might entail um, having to uh, making this addition to the wheelchair um, without having to purchase a new one. You know what I'm saying? And the lifespan on these wheelchairs, you also will see uh, that the VA purchase a lot, purchases a lot of scooters for our veterans. Um, it all depends. It's like driving your own car, okay? A lot of it depends on how well you take care of it, the terrain that you're, you're, you're ambulating, rolling in, and if you're taking care of your equipment. Um, you know, we live, we're obviously here in Colorado, I know like for me right now, I've got a mud bath going on in my driveway after the uh, rain and, and snow we just got last night. If you chose to take a power wheelchair down my driveway, it's not gonna last <laughs> as long as one that, that is only driven on, on the concrete or inside of the house. Um, and if I had a power wheelchair and had to use it, I wouldn't recommend going down my driveway right now. It needs to dry out a little bit. So, um, and I mean that in, in all sincerity. Um, uh, we do have veterans that live in uh, more of a mountainous or rural terrain. And so the type of chair and or wheels and all that kind of stuff uh, really start uh, mm. playing havoc on what's available and what's not available. So, but yeah, they're coming out with all kinds of new features on these chairs. It's, it's really, it, it's amazing what they can do nowadays. You also have to be aware if you have a lift on your vehicle for your power wheelchair, please be aware that whenever we start adding more equipment onto that wheelchair, it adds to the weight and you, you, you do want your prosthetics team to verify that your lift will be able to continue to, to um, maintain that chair and or have to make, you know, some other decisions on possibly a new lift or something. Well, I just, I just, Jane was uh, instrumental in uh, getting my wheelchair for me, uh, which I'm using as we speak. Uh, so if I wanted uh, rear view mirrors and uh, a fuzzy dice hanging from them and an eight track tape, I would have to call back then and get that, right? And so oh, you're gonna... get it medically justified. <laughs> yeah, would... and, and with all due respect, Jim, you're going to have to talk to old Gary and <laughs> new, new hub, I want new, new, spin, spin, yeah. spinner hub caps, make it shiny, make it fancy. Okay, uh, next is yeah. there a, was there another question there that we needed to cover? Yeah, there's. Uh, it looks like uh, three more uh, to touch on. One of them was uh, asking about weight. Uh, beddings, different beddings, like yeah. weighted coverings, things like that. And they were asking if it would fall under the clothing allowance. So uh, per national policy, uh, we actually only provide weighted vests. And um, that is for people with balance disorders. It's usually for neurological and orthopedic balance disorders. We do not provide any kind of weighted blankets because as of now, there's been no medical evidence of it being an effective treatment for anything. Um, 
Now, that being said, there are things I have seen us purchase, like frames that hold the blanket off of the body, but that's usually to prevent bed sores or friction sores, or if a veteran overheats, maybe it holds the blanket up off their feet. Um, and of course, prosthetics will provide variations of hospital beds with variations of the mattress on it, including ones that auto rotate you. So like if you need to rotate to avoid bed sores, it'll do it automatically. We have ones that uh, are vented and, and have fans in them to keep the body cool. So we, when, when you say bedding, we, we offer the, the durable side of it, but as far as like weighted blankets, things like that, we, we do not provide that. Can you touch on the question on the robotics, the development of that? I think there was a question in the queue. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we actually uh, we actually put that in the chat. I apologize. We did jump over that. So uh, what robotic equipment is available? I, we would just need more than... <laughs> we offer everything from like Omni feeders. We've done a couple. They were not very successful kind of here at our facility. I'm sure there are stories of it being successful, but they're robotic feeder plates. We offer robotic limbs. Uh, like I was mentioning, we do research and development on the exoskeletons. When people say robotics, it is a wide range of things. Um, we offer tablets that translate, you know, touch to voice, which some people would consider robotic. Um, but for arms and legs, uh, if you're talking about, do you know, are they talking about amputation or are they talking about like an exoskeleton? I think it was more of an exoskeleton. Um, I was looking at a video from uh, the Muscular Dystrophy Society and the, the mm -hmm. people that had this, uh, the individual had one limb, all the limbs were still attached, but the arm was, one arm was less um, mobile than the other. And it was one adaptive device that would help raise his arms and stuff like that. So. Okay, so I will, I will tell you historically, historically, those devices take a long time because you're going to be doing, they, they are available. We do offer robotic devices has to be prescribed. Well, you have to be referred to a clinic, I should say first, and right. they're going to see if your body can use it properly because the way all those robotic devices work is you have to have control of the device somewhere else on your body. And you have to be able to train your body to use that device in some other way. Does that make sense? Most of them are not triggered unless you're talking about the ones that just increase strength and things. For um, for example, the sensors would be, I don't know. If, yeah, you can see the sensors would be clear up here and it would be moving this joint down at your elbow. So you would have to train your body to flex your shoulder muscles. And if you're unable to do that, this isn't going to do you any good. It's just added weight to your limb. Um, for the legs, they are developing lots of ways to do uh, what they call, what's it? Oh, sorry. My brain is pretty much uh, less pressure on the legs, but to increase your mobility. Uh, but they're doing that a lot with power wheelchairs instead. That, that tilt that you, I think, was brought up in an earlier question is to give you some pressure on your legs so your muscle mass doesn't break down. That is a um, productive way to maintain your muscle mass. Uh, the exoskeletons can do that, but again, the use of them is difficult. So we have never issued an exoskeleton at my facility. We're a small facility. We're the second smallest in the nation, um, but we have a lab with three prosthetists, orthotists. They have done one robotic arm, but it was for an amputation. And it had the built-in sensors and everything. So, like I said, there, you'd have to get to referral. You'd have to go through a whole screening where they will design this piece by piece around your body. And you would have to show that you can use it. And they're not going to do it for short term because it's going to be so custom that no one else would be able to use it. So, if you're looking at it, and you're like, uh, you know, the expect if if the clinician looks at it, ultimately it's their decision, and they say this is going to take us six months to develop and get it in a place where we feel comfortable giving it to the veteran. And in six months, you're deteriorating, or your ability to use it changes, or maybe cognitive abilities change. 
they can't give it to anyone. And so I think that's a consideration that the clinicians make often. They say, is it better just to get them in a chair that provides that same ability or give them some other adaptive device? But again, if it's ordered for you, we can absolutely do it. There's, there's lots of stuff there. And I did put the link to the research site that talks about that in the chat. If you want to click that link, that is a public. Um, if you've never been to the VA's official site, it's kind of neat because you click on each service line. So like examples, rehab medicine, and then under rehab medicine is a whole section for prosthetics. And then you check under research development. There's a whole section for prosthetics. We, we are involved in several different areas, but. Are you, are you part of my healthy vet? Is that all in there? My healthy vet? I am. Okay. So I, I respond to things in my healthy vet. I'm not sure if they have links, I think they have links to a lot of this stuff in there. I don't, I'm a terrible patient. I don't use my healthy vet. I call my doctor and, and then forget that I called him. So, well, you know, you... to piggyback on that, um, you know, another really good source that I know personally I rely on within our VA um, is our social workers. Mm -hmm. God, these yep. people do amazing things. And uh, sometimes I'll hit them with a, a really bizarre question. And it it's not the first time they've heard of it. You know what I'm saying? And uh, they're, they, they can be a, a, a tremendous source for you as your eyes and ears within the VA community you know, for some of this kind of stuff, like, like Dustin has talked about, you know, um, um, the social workers, they're pendulum boy it swings a, a wide range and I, I wouldn't hesitate at all to uh to build up a relationship with your social worker um and then also even just your local dav because they are they're they're out in the community they, they see a lot of stuff and oftentimes they they can be some really good eyes and ears for you um to help with that Dustin, um, you mentioned that you are the smallest clinic where you're making the largest impact with all these veterans that are on today. Oh, that's great. That that hyperlink, I would like, I appreciate that. I would like to point out a lot of the questions um, you you all are asking about, like the electronic stimulation and stuff, it's all referenced on there. And it, again, it shows you that Cleveland, because uh, Ohio has a huge research yep. center, it shows you what they've done, um, what they found. It talks about using the uh, EMS stuff with exoskeletons on veterans it's it is a really interesting site that gives you a lot of um information of like hey i see you guys are working on this um but i mean they've got the rope that's why i was saying ro robot wheelchair everything's robot i think people just like to say it's a robot it's a wheelchair but they have everything in there so i would highly encourage you all to go to that site because it talks about all types of different studies that they've done um, it's not a long long list but it is a lot of the questions you asked are actually touched on in there and, and will tell you exactly what the va has been doing to research and develop new technologies for that we, after, we've had one of after, those uh, robotic wheelchairs here in our area and actually have seen it go upstairs yeah, which yeah. is it's, it's mind-blowing um, yeah has that's that gyro somewhat stuff. somewhat <laughs> scary to take a wheelchair upstairs that's uh no, and coming uh, down is even more scary from from uh from this discussion uh let me uh let me ask something a little more direct for inclusion body myositis uh for jane and for dustin one of the characteristics of this disease that we all share is the deterioration of the muscles not only in the quads, but also in the finger flexor muscles of the forearms. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, it affects our ability to grip. We cannot, we don't have the, the dexterity any longer because those muscles have deteriorated. Is there any device within the VA system that you're aware of that can help us with things that, you know, lifting up when it gets to the advanced stages? it becomes quite difficult to, to lift things. I drop things constantly. And, and I'm very dependent upon my wife to clean up after me. But are there other devices that would help us uh, in a compensatory type of, of uh, system that would help us 
get that hand flexibility back? So th this is where, again, we can say, yes, there, there are devices. There's always, we're developing those things at, at the mm -hmm. Cleveland FES Center. Again, Ohio is doing that functional electrical stimulation research there. Um, what I, I can't say is we can get you the device without a clinician. I, I would encourage you to meet, reach out to uh, the, your primary care, get a referral mm -hmm. to rehab medicine to see a hand specialist. Yeah. We have teams that can do exercises, training. They can provide gloves and other adaptive devices. Um, we, have one, we lost Susan. Um, do we have a new mm -hmm. hand specialist here? Uh, it's Helen. Is it Helen? Okay. Uh -huh. So we do yeah. still have one at Grand Junction, um, but there are occupational therapists and physical therapists that specialize in hands. And if you can get in with one of them, hopefully they can come up with a solution with you, Jim. That that would be my recommendation for that, for your dexterity okay. issue. Thank, thank you for that yeah. answer. Yeah. And then, you know, there's also some simple things that we can, again, through, you know, a consult, you know, there's uh, specialty eating utensils that we can purchase. Um, some you can still hold, others you literally Velcro it to your hand so that you don't accidentally drop it. Um, there's uh, uh, feeding dishes that, you know, are available that, that give you, uh, um, that are designed for just that whenever you, you're, you're, losing a lot of your dexterity, you know, that type of stuff. But again, that would all have to come via a consult through yeah. your, I, I would be seeing a hand specialist. Yeah. And to kind of and piggyback on that as well, like I said, we have robot feeders that we've purchased in the past. Mm -hmm. um, those are, those are problematic at best. <laughs> not, not for the fact that uh, they don't work, the device works. But the problem is there's usually not enough justification, and then there's not enough follow-up to show that it is an actual direct and active compo <clears throat> excuse me, component of your treatment plan. So historically at our location, that's been the issue we've had. But that would be like a, that would be like an interdisciplinary team of occupational therapists and nutritionists working with you on if you're to that point to where you have no hand dexterity and you but you can reach out and touch a button that's how the omni robot works it, it actually scoops feeds you 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 can sit at the table all you have to do is touch the button um but again we're looking for that justification and that follow-up so if that if we don't feel that we can get that those can be denied or we'll put them before a committee to be voted on and to see if it's okay. the right item. So, so your clinician, I, I will usually try to start with like, uh, what's the the least mechanical device first because mm -hmm. it's less likely to fail, and and so they'll start with something simple, and then we'll slowly progress to those robots. And those robots, you know, even that simple feeding one, it is literally pretty much just a pivot point that turns. It's more complicated than that, but it's it's thousands and thousands of dollars. Whereas if we can get you a, a spoon that has a gyroscopic thing mm -hmm. in it that keeps the weight balanced in your palm, that's like $75. And it's less likely to fail because it's just a counterweight that as your dexterity goes, it transfers the weight to whichever side is holding it the best, you know, or think, or like the Velcro one, Jane Ann said, that's, that's how they're going to kind of progress your treatment with equipment. And the clinicians that you're referring to, are those are available within the VA healthcare system or you're referring to a community uh, outside the VA healthcare system? So that, that, would, depend on the, that would depend on the VA. Um, I'm pretty sure every VA has occupational therapist, but if you are out in the community, you would be, if you were doing all your care through community care, you would be referred to an occupational therapist. Occupational therapists <laughs> specialize in what they call your ADLs, your assisted daily living activities okay and so they actually will help you figure out ways to get in and out of the bath uh feed yourself get dressed they'll do simple things like button hook handles to help you button mm -hmm. your shirt if you if you can't do the fine motor skills with your fingers to button your shirt they have devices it's a little button hook thing that help you do that occupational therapy is a gifted group that can help you figure out what you need to complete whatever you want to maintain your independence in the home.
Dustin, I remember seeing at some time uh, in the past a, a catalog, per se, that I believe the provider was, I think, Peterson or Patterson, if I remember correctly. But are you aware of any supplier commercially that has a catalog of these compensatory devices that would be uh, useful for us to review? There's so many. Oh, okay. Yeah, we, we, we deal with so, so many different vendors. And yes, um, um, what we do is we, we divvy it out by distributors. So uh, some mm -hmm. of these, uh, like, like you said, Patterson, um, Performance Health, we do US1 Supply, Veterans Medical Supply. There's, they all carry prices. different items. Yeah. Um, they all carry different items. They specialize in different areas, but then the vast majority of them also just have basic durable medical equipment like shower okay. chairs and things like that. Very good. Thank you. Seth, you had a question. If you would uh, unmute yourself there, we'll be able to hear it. Yeah. I um, went through the, you know, got the clinician, got the okay for this uh, thing called a sea brace uh, for the leg. And, um, I, so who is, is it the purchaser, the last guy to, you know, put the order through this thing is very expensive. And when I talked to him, he said he had to send it to the higher ups. Well, that was two months ago. I'm like, okay, so either yes or no, what is it? And uh, who do I need to talk to, to move that process along or, uh, who, who's got the final say on that? I, think I would reach out to your ordering clinician and find out what the status is. Yeah, and, yeah. and you, you said put, it's very expensive. So if it's very expensive, and is it, what was the device again? I didn't call it a seat brace. A seat brace. brace. It's, oh, a seat brace. It's, it's not, yeah, it's not $10,000 or more. Okay. Mm -mm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it is actually. <laughs> It's in uh, the high twenties. Yeah, Ed, wow. Ed well, Arnold, uh, uh, you've had experience with this. You want to unmute yourself and share with us uh, your experiences. So you're talking about the C brace, right, Seth? Yeah. So I was fitted for a C brace about uh, three or four months ago, and it's a very big process to try to get a C brace. Um, and and the VA told me even after I was fitted for this thing, that I would have to wear a pair of ankle foot orthotics, custom made ankle foot orthotics for a period of 30 days, just to see how I reacted to that, to those uh, particular devices before they would actually get the C brace. So it's a process you'd have to go through to try to get it. And truthfully, now looking back on it, I'm kind of glad I don't have the C brace. So, yeah. Was, was, did you begin, Ed? Did you begin your uh, uh, investigative questioning of the C brace needs through your primary care physician at the VA or through physical therapy? Through occupational therapy. Through right. occupational mm -hmm. therapy. They're they're the ones who initiated that, then, right? Technically, the prosthetics and orthotics department. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. I, my question is, I, you know, I know the process because I've been through it. Right. But at the, you know, they're at the purchasing point, you know, the doctor and I've been, they've uh, molded my leg. They've gone through everything. Yeah. Just need the final okay. And uh, they're just dragging their feet. So is that, you so know. I would say most likely they're not dragging their feet. Most likely it had to be submitted to contracting which is a regional office. If it's over $10,000, our staff cannot purchase it. Okay. And then contracting negotiates those prices based off Medicare uh, pricing with the vendor mm -hmm. to ensure that we're not overpaying for the device because we okay. are stewards of taxpayer dollars. Right. So we try to get the Medicare rate if we can. And then the other thing is on that is, again, we we're not saying this is what's happening here, but there are issues where when you're doing things like this, certain components or material are not readily available for manufacturing. Yeah. So we have some veterans, an example I'll use, we have a veteran that has a very, very um, standard foot 
And it took us a long time just to get a replacement because the materials they used to make those feet were being used to make hospital beds and wheelchairs instead. Right. So what, what we found is a lot of vendors, the delay in getting products is because they're shifting manufacturing because they don't have the staff to run their manufacturing at full speed all the time. So they're shifting their staff to particular products. And what that does is that causes delays. So if they spend two weeks pumping out a bunch of wheelchair frames and then they shift over two right. weeks, you know, so that yeah. would be, could be part of the delay, but it also, it is, if it's over 10,000, it's going to contracting. Which okay. Takes how long, long. How, but, how they generally take? Cause I, well, I'm thinking it, that's where it is. Well, yeah. And, and so, so to kind of roll back, Seth, I would reach out to your occupational therapist and tell them that, you know, you, obviously they know this too, that you haven't received it. How can you follow up? Because if it, in our VA, our occupational therapist would be say, would say, this has been sent to prosthetics. This is the purchasing agent. And then you can start getting in touch with that purchasing agent. And then when we submit anything to contracting, like, like Dustin said, I, I've got my charge cards, but I can only max out at $10,000. And then I have to submit this package to contracting. Um, it can take contracting where I live anywhere between two and four weeks to then submit a PO to the manufacturer or vendor that it's being purchased from. And then now it's in the vendor's hand. And so, but, but it's very easy for your, your prosthetic purchasing agent or prosthetic representative to follow up with contracting to find out what the status is. And we then can call the vendor, let's say that they'll say they got the PO a month ago. We can find out what the status is uh, through the vendor and, and, you know, see where they're at. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we prosthetics also is happy to do your leg work for you too, like this, because we have a vested interest too. We want to take care of our veterans. And uh, if we get, if we get something stuck in contracting, which, usually is not the case. I mean, they move on these things as fast as they can. Um, but we, we also need to notify them if, if something is at a bottleneck for whatever reason, so that we can keep moving forward with this procurement. Yeah. Okay. And just one other quick question. Um, <clears throat> some people are, you know, have been getting the ND lift one way or another. I uh, saw that. Yeah. The, the, Char the Charleston VA, uh, I'm, I'm in South Carolina. Uh, they're very good, and I, I like them, but uh, they've never actually given anyone an Indy Lift. And Indy Lift only got the ability to deal with Medicare four months ago. Um, so they are now available through Medicare or the VA. But I know that they, the VA in Durham, North Carolina, has issued these to veterans. And is, I mean, is that something Charleston will be like, Oh no, we're not going to give those out because we just don't do that. Or when you say, "Well, Durham does," you know, I mean, and, and I'll leave it like that. But that's that's the question I have: is I mean, do they talk nationally, or are they just strictly local? Well, so I, I can't. Speak to them. Okay, I'm sorry, Dustin. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so yes, we do talk. We literally do a a, a weekly national call or monthly national call where all facilities get on together and review updated regulations, things like that. Um, and questions are brought up on those. I will tell you when a new product gets approved by the FDA and is approved for all the other issues, what happens is the national office will say, we will write a national policy on it. Some facilities will wait for that policy to become public and others will wait to see it if that makes sense. Uh, again, it also depends on how your clinician is writing that order. Is it a comfort and convenience? Is it, um, are they listing it as a, the, the biggest mistake they can make is say you want it, but they don't justify it for you. Uh, they don't say this is I the justification. A, I, I have the thing right here. It says me medical necessity is, I guess, one of the terms they like to see, I guess. So the term is, yes, it has to be, it has to be listed as this is where these things like indie lifts and stuff 
remember, we are basing these decisions off laws written by Congress. They are Code of Federal Regulation. And the Code of Federal Regulation states it will be a direct and active component of your treatment. So one of the reasons the Indy Lift is disputed facility by facility is some leadership states it's not direct and it's not active. It is responsive and inactive for most of the time unless something terrible happens. So obviously what, again, based on the culture of your facility, it's gonna be different. Some will read that and say, okay, well, how do we say it's direct and active and try to work towards that? And other facilities will not. The problem is <clears throat> if we don't have that policy clearly stated at the national level, it is up for interpretation. The Code of Federal, Reg Federal Regulations states direct and active, and it is only active when in use and it's indirect because it, again, is used as needed. So uh, it, it really depends on your local facility. Um, I won't say that every facility is going to read and interpret a law the same. I guarantee if every one of you read that law, you would come back with different <laughs> you know, evaluations of, of what that means. Um, so that, that would be my answer on that. The Indy Lift is a, is a great product. It is great uh, for use with the caretaker as well as the veteran. You know, um, it can be a big help. But ultimately, until the policy is officially written, it is at the determination of the medical facility. That is the words they use. Okay. When, All right. When Thanks. I when I posed that similar question to Jane, uh, when I, I I asked her about why do some veterans get things from their VA and other veterans are denied it from from their VA, and she said there's a saying within the VA uh, healthcare system that when you talk to one VA hospital, you talk to one VA hospital. So <laughs> they are indeed apparently independent and responsible for their own individual decision-making on those things, unfortunately. Yep. Now on that same note, if they do release a policy, if they were to address this specific device at the national office, which there are questions asking for that to happen, then no one would be able to dispute it one way or the other. So what, what you'll see from the field staff, because the problem is they, they release these, these, laws and regulations to us and then at the bottom of these laws and regulations they'll say at the determination of the facility to determine a local process and so uh, when we have these devices that are being asked for at different locations and we recognize that everyone is interpreting it differently we actually notify central office and say hey this product or this device is unclear to us whether it falls within this law or not. And so then we will, during our monthly meetings, get updates. So you are, you are indeed bound by Title 38. So and we, we are bound. I don't know if Jane and I think she put it in the chat. There are actually several different laws depending on the program. But yes, uh, we are bound by that Code of okay. Federal Regulation 38. Yeah. That's the same. That's the same title. That's the same uh, component of the uh, uh, federal codes that we're battling to get the our disease, this inclusion body myositis, listed as a presumptive or service connected oh disease. It's the same yeah. same thing we're fighting with. Yes. Are there uh, are there other questions from anyone that uh, like to uh, Larry unmute yourself there and and uh, go ahead. I was wondering what determines, who determines, how much uh, is allowed to be allocated to a HISA grant? Like I had a small amount of work done to my bathroom and I needed something else done to my other bathroom. And they said, I've used my grant. What do so, I do? So that grant total is based off the Veterans Benefits VBA. Um, we follow the regulations on that. The determination is based off your service-connected disability. All right, uh, I have no service-connected. I have no service-connected rating. So the, I know that there is, especially with the cost increase for construction materials, there is a push right now by the VA to obtain more funding for that program. 
but that grant program, if you're non-service connected, it is $2,000 across the board is your lifetime entitlement right now. Uh, we've got uh, somebody put up a screen sharing there. Uh, I think that's Bruce Kern. If you could yeah, Bruce, maybe sign off could, and then sign could... back on again, please. Looks like he's doing a test drive with his car and uh, something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I've got, I'm trying to get that where it's. Bruce has to sign out in order for us to get rid of that on the screen. Here, let me do so this. You mentioned the, uh, the, the button hook. And one of the things that I was unaware of was a clothing allowance program. Can you talk about that or Jane, please? The clothing allowance is uh, something that you apply for every year. And um, it is to give the veteran money for any prosthetic device that they are using that can wear, tear, or um, damage the clothing. Uh, there's some medications that fall into those guidelines. And um, again, it's something that you apply for every year. Um, if you were in a wheel, well, let's see, if you're in a manual wheelchair, you know, you do, you, you will find that you're going to wear out your, your, your pants and your back, you know, shirts, that type of stuff. You oftentimes might get your um, uh, shirt kind of caught in the, the, the wheel, so to speak, or, you know, it rubs. And so that's what the program is designed for, is to reimburse you for outer clothing. It will not cover uh, undergarments or socks, uh, just your outer clothing. Um, if you wear an AFO, if you are missing a limb, uh, that type of stuff, uh, you qualify. Um, and it also depends on your service connection for that particular uh, body part and or device that you're using. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit more in detail. So the percentage of service connectivity is a component in what we can and cannot uh, expect from the, uh, from the VA then, is that, that that's correct? Yes, regarding these programs, as far as like HISA, like we just talked about, and how much money you're eligible for, clothing allowance, whether or not that uh, um, AFO is uh, considered um, service connected or non service connected. That's to, those are through the grant programs. But okay. to actually provide you with that device. You don't have to be service connected. You just have to show that there's medical necessity for it. So, so the programs are the ones that are dependent upon your level of disability, whereas the, the devices themselves are available even without a service connection, then. more or less. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank and you. an example of that, an example of that, Jim, is like I, I had multiple knee surgeries while I was in the service so that when I got out, I had knee problems. So they gave me a custom knee brace for my service connected knee that made me eligible for the clothing allowance. But my percentage oh. on my knee only makes me eligible for the lowest level of the HISA. So HISA, as you get a higher disability rate, you have to have 50% or more for one service connection, or they have to be treating something that is that, then, then okay. your HISA will go up. Um, the clothing allowance is very particular that whatever is breaking down your clothes has to be linked to a service connected issue. If I had a brace on my left knee and my right knee, I would only be eligible for one clothing allowance because my left knee is not service connected, but my right knee is, if, if that clears they, that up. They, they don't make it easy, do they? I, what um, are you well, so I'll tell you, when I, when I, when they, I, they don't make it my, easy on us either, Joe. <laughs> no, I know. When they, when I applied, I'll tell you this to, you know, Dustin, I'll, I'll share this with you. When I applied for my disability um, initially, way back when, many, many years ago, I had a, a hearing loss in my left ear and my, the, the uh, CMP exam said that I needed both ears. Uh, I, I, I worked 18 inches away from the air intake of an F4. 
uh, for three years. That'll uh, believe me, they're, they're loud. <laughs> so when I got my denial, believe it or not, it said that my hearing loss in my left ear was service connected, but the hearing loss in my right ear was not. That's, that's funny. <laughs> that's funny. So and, uh, you sit there and you scratch <laughs> your head and you go, who, who decided this thing? You know? <laughs> so, so it is, uh, like I said, they just don't make it easy. No, they don't. I, I got hearing aids at, man, how old was I? I was 23, I think, when I got hearing aids. Oh, my. They were, like, they were like, oh, you you didn't you didn't lose your hearing in the military, but we'll give you tinnitus. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. And that's, that's what I had to do. And that's, I think, what many of us here uh, share that thing we all put in for, for the tinnitus. Uh, because the, uh, the actual, the deafness itself is not a compensatable disability where the tinnitus right. is. Right. Right. So are there any other questions from anyone that, uh, you know, Jim, I, I see one here in the chat. Um, it looks like they put in, does the VA provide upright walkers and lightweight scooters? Okay. Um, Yes, and somewhat yes to the scooters. Again, it depends on what is medically necessary. And again, an upright walker, that is something that you're going to have to work with your physical therapy and or occupational therapist with. But we do provide upright walkers. And I want to say we provide them frequently. And we're a small VA. Um, they, um, they've come out with a really nice one for a lot of our Parkinson's patients that um, uh, they use. And again, just depending on what your, your, your issue is, your medical issue is, um, sometimes an upright walker is much more appropriate than just the traditional four-wheel roll later or the front wheel walker. Um, lightweight scooters. This is one of those items that we do purchase off of contract and it all depends on your clinician and what you're trying to do with these scooters. Um, I, if you're looking for a scooter that's going to fold up and you can just throw in the back of your trunk, you're going to have to talk to your occupational therapist about those. Those are, those are toughies because then, you know, the, the next reaction that somebody's going to have is, well, if you're strong enough to fold this thing up and put it in the back of your trunk, I don't know if you really need it. You know, um, we do have a, a variety of scooters that our clinicians order for veterans once they have been deemed medically necessary for a power mobility device. And then also yeah. just personal experience, those, those lightweight scooters tend to be easier to tip over because yes. they don't have that weight at the base. So if you have any stability issues or anything like that, that your, your clinical team will shy away from the lightweights mm -hmm. because they like the stability of the heavier base. So if you were to accidentally lean, it's not going to dump you on the sidewalk because that's the last thing we want. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, there were a couple other questions on the bottom of this email that we hadn't touched on, but they're really quick ones. One okay. of them was, who does the prostatic sensory aid service department report to? Um, alignment for service lines varies by facility. So like um, at our facility, the orthotics and prosthetics lab does not even fall under prosthetics. They fall under rehab medicine. Um, but total overall, traditionally prosthetics reports up through the associate director's chain of command. We are, again, we're considered the administrative side. We don't even fall on the chief of staff side. So we will report up through the associate directors. Now there are some that fall under like the nursing chain and things like that, but the alignment is based on the facilities um, and their director. Their director builds how he wants his facility to be ran and managed. But traditionally and most common, if you work with prosthetics, all of our actions are being reported up through the associate director. Um, the other one was, how often do vendors bring you new ideas for equipment or do these ideas come from the vets? So there's multiple ways you can go about doing this. We actually encourage that if you have ideas, um, maybe reach out to the research and development team, which again, um, I've sent you the link on, say, hey, I'm interested in B. And what they will 
do if they if it's something they're truly interested in doing, um, they will actually bring you in to trial the device if they think it will work for you. Uh, if if they think it's a great idea, but it wouldn't work for you if because because of the conditions or things like that, they will try to get someone to volunteer to be the trial person for those devices. And then, of course, vendors are always trying to get the federal government to spend money. So we we get we get emails daily, multiple emails. Hey, this new device. Hey, we've added this to our catalog. Hey, we've done this. Just want to make sure you put this out to the clinical team. And that's usually what we do. We we receive, oh, this is our latest and greatest version of this device, or hey, this is our competitive version for this vendor that you normally use. This is our competitive version. Can you get this out to the clinical staff? Because again, we will not make the determination of what device you get. The clinician will. We're just giving them as much information as possible. And then um, we are, as prosthetics, of course, encouraged to watch, you know, like news clippings or anything like that from like science based news or any kind of medical based news to see if there's some hospital out there trialing something new you know, or new equipment being used, or maybe one of the areas I like to watch because we work so closely with them is Israel comes out with a lot of amazing equipment. They take our designs and they, they make them usually lighter and more efficient and easier to manufacture. So I do like to watch a lot of the news coming out of the medical side of Israel because they, they do that. Interesting. Very yep. interesting. Yep. Um, uh, Seth, I see that you still have your hand up. Was that another question or did you just keep that? Uh... No, I could, uh, I got to figure out how to turn it off. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, that's good. Uh, 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 Jane, let me ask this. Is the VA healthcare system divided into regions or is it each individual hospital then reports to one centrally uh, uh, located uh, sort of command center, if you will? Uh, nationally, or are they divided into regions? We, we are divided into regions, and we call them VISN, V-I-S-N. And like right now, Grand Junction is in VISN 19. Okay. So and, and we, is, that your, is that your reporting? Is that who basically you report to or... Uh, well, our, our immediate chain of command is obviously Dustin, uh, the chief of logistics, and then the AD and ultimately uh, the uh, facility director. But yes, we also have a Vizen prosthetic rep. Every Vizen has a, a Vizen prosthetic rep. Um, and they, while they, help me out here a little bit, Dustin, while, yeah. while they, they, they don't, they, they so don't. They don't critique. Well, yeah, go ahead, Dustin. Keep I was going. going to say ultimate goal of a of a Vizen prosthetic rep is to communicate up to central office concerns from the facilities and communicate down those policy changes to the frontline staff and then help them develop processes and things. If they're struggling, they're also able to work with other regional office managers for other service lines. So uh, say, for example, if we were having issues with our cardiopulmonary team, there is also someone for cardiopulmonary at the regional office level. And that's not happening here, but I'm just using that as an example. And I were to reach out to the Vizin prosthetic rep, say, hey, we're having this issue. He would then find policies and things like that from other locations in the region. And we do try to standardize those processes by mm -hmm. region as much as we can. But because, again, every facility is different in how it's managed, um, the Vizin uh, prosthetic rep kind of manages that. So he he gives us all the information he can and then sends up our questions. Um, but yes, I we uh, the regional offices, there's 23. Yeah, I think 23 so. regions, uh, 132 facilities in the nation so um it's a big big chain of hospitals and you know when you when you talk about like a product like this um oh i just lost it the indie lift that we were talking about you know the visions are, are are getting more and more active to have regular meetings and 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 group chats 
when they start having veterans and or clinicians asking for particular products, you know, have you seen this? Has your, has your, has your VA come across this yet? And um, it opens up a, a wide panel of discussion on FDA approval. Is this something that's really safe for the veteran to have in their home? Um, um, Again, we're not the ones that can order it, but we certainly can't ask the questions if this is a safe device that we're purchasing for the veteran and or if this is going to cause any additional costs or um, problems for the veteran. Because anything that the, the prosthetics department, any of the DMA products that we provide, we also have to provide service on those items. Uh, Jim, your wheelchair is a good example. Anytime you have any problems with it, I don't want you to have to pay for that that neither, neither do i neither do i <laughs> <laughs> and um um i'm gonna throw it out there we we got a consult for a uh swimming pool not too long ago one of those above the ground pools well we had to deny it and one of the big reasons that we denied it was well we don't offer hot tubs jacuzzis that type of stuff <laughs> but also the uh the cost that the veteran would would be burned with to one keep that thing heated keep in mind they're in colorado uh it might get up to 51 today but boy it's it's gonna get down to around i don't know what 30 tonight you're heating that thing yeah. um you also have to fill that thing up with water it requires chemicals um you know so that that kind of stuff we 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 can't realistically provide products that are going to cause the veteran undue burden on cost and or your sanity so to speak good uh larry i see your hand up uh larry i'm going to get to you just in one second here but let me follow up with another question given the cost of these things does the va facility uh deal with a a set budget for for um the prosthetics department and are those different? Are those budgets different throughout the country? That's my favorite <laughs> question. I am the numbers guy. I love budgets. So uh, every facility monitors. We have what's called the National Prosthetics Patient Database. We track every dollar we spend. It has to be linked directly to a veteran's record, medical record. Um, prosthetics is funded with special purpose funds, means we actually do not receive funding from the facility except for to pay the employees to work. So uh, we are all individually funded. We determine our own budgets based on the programs and how much we traditionally have. So for example, I'll use home oxygen because that's one of our easiest ones to track. Uh, we would look at the fact that Colorado or Grand Junction has roughly, we'll say 2000 veterans in the program and each veteran costs $83 and 87 cents a day or a month, you know? So we would calculate that and we would submit that up through our regional office, who will then compile our regional budget. And then he will send that up to central office and central office will compile the national budget and we will pitch that idea to Congress. And if they approve the amount we want, again, we're not funded with the facility. It's two separate baskets of money. Our money comes out in this basket to central office they divvy out to the regional office and then the regional office divvies it out to the facility and as the year progresses if say for example our orthotic and prosthetic lab just started ramping up and doing a ton of limbs and we did not account for that cost we can actually reach out to the other locations within our vision we'll always start within our region and we'll say hey i'm going to be two hundred thousand dollars shy this year um, for my annual budget and then all the facilities can say, well, I could spot 20,000 and they would give us 20,000 or sometimes I'll say, hey, I'm going to be over 200,000. Does anyone need it to wrap up a program for the year? Because the one good thing about our funding is if, if we facilities are individually funded and they're held to that and and they get dinged for it, we are we have a lot of freedom because it's special purpose funds. We have a lot of freedom to shift the money around as needed. Um, 
because our, our ultimate goal, our ultimate goal, and then eventually uh, what will happen is near the end of the year, everyone will send their excess funds back. And, and we actually obviously prefer that because it, again, you know, we're, we're trying to be good stewards of the taxpayer dollar where we can't, our funding is set up to where we can't just blow the money at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. um, an example of that I know I touched briefly on it with Jane Ann is uh, say, for example, I have a $10 million budget. I have to prove through the, that national prosthetics patient database that I have spent 98% of my money on veterans directly. So I'm given a 2% cushion. That now, means... from, a, from, a, from a background in finance, then let me ask this question. Yes. Are you on a calendar year, fiscal year, or, fiscal. or you're, you're on a calendar fiscal year? We're on a fiscal year. So it uh, begins October 1st of every year. And oh, so, so, it's, so, it is, so it's October fiscal. and not January to December. Fiscal, Correct. Yeah. It is a that, fiscal okay. year. That said, if a veteran needs something like the wheelchair or any other uh, durable medical equipment, is it more advantageous for that veteran to apply for that earlier in the year? No, prosthetics does not run out of money because of what <laughs> just from what Dustin just said is we yeah. are special purpose funding, and if a okay. v, if a VA is starts operate their prosthetics department starts operating in the red they then start reaching out to their vision prosthetic rep and they start trying to shift money uh within yep. the vision and if they need need be they go up higher to congress to get more money yep. and and, um, and we never <clears throat> i have never seen a facility actually run out of money because we do right. account we try to account for growth and things like that when we when we project our budget of course you try to anticipate okay you know you're getting an extra 100 veterans you know a year in this program and now you're getting like we had one program grow from oh shoot i had the numbers pulled up. it was 84 patients a year and within three years we'd grown the program to where i know i showed you Gina, i think it was like five thousand patients <laughs> Wow, that was, a, that was our OMP program. in a three-year. It was yeah, OMP. yeah, you're right. Yeah, because we, we we were able to bring a lot of OMP in house. Where in the yeah. past we had to go out to the community. And Let me drill down. That's going to affect every single one of you guys. Y'all don't worry about our budget, and do yep. not think that prosthetics is going to say, "Hmm, veteran Cressman, Let me look at your record. We have spent. I'm just throwing out a, a fictitious number. $15,000 on you this year. I'm not going to give you any more money. No, we don't operate like that. No. When it's okay. medically necessary and you need equipment, we're going to get it to you. Um, with that being said, you know, we work diligently with our occupational therapists, PTs, and social workers. Um, there's times where we have a veteran that, uh, again, I'm just going to we can either use your diagnosis as a good example or somebody that might have had uh, a stroke, unsuspected, you know. In order to get this person out of, out of the hospital, we've got to get him a ramp. We've got to get him a hospital bed. We need to get him a bedside, and I don't mean just him. Th these are also including women. We need to get this veteran uh, uh, a bedside commode. We need a, at least somewhat of a walker before we even start talking about power wheelchairs and stuff like that our goal right now is to get them home and boy you start adding some of this stuff up and the dollar figures quickly mount but we don't look at that we look at procuring the equipment and getting it set up as quickly as we can so that we can facilitate that veteran to get home well, once they get that's, home uh, yeah that's <clears throat> that's that's very comforting to know yeah once um, they get once they get home then you have to start getting into the whole you know um yeah. possible home health you know is the family really going to be able to get a hold of them that doesn't have anything to do with prosthetics and us procuring you know the, the stuff Good. um and uh Sud, you've got your your hand up yeah uh, well forgive forgive me if i may uh, larry had what? his hand up here earlier if i can if i can ask larry oh, to go okay ahead i'm sorry give us give us his question go ahead larry Question. I have 0% of disability, but I'm considered catastrophically disabled, which gives me 
every medical need that I need, uh, supposedly. Mm -hmm. uh, why then would my HISA grant be based on percent of disability versus catastrophically disabled, which gives me everything that I need except the thing I need? Yeah, <laughs> so that's unfortunate. Can, yeah. That Okay. Uh, I can actually speak to that. There actually is a part that talks about if you have a documented disability um, that is recognized by the VA as a disability and it is being treated as if service connected, they can adjust your HISA entitlement. But that is something you'd yeah. have to work. You'd have to work with your um, your primary care team. Make sure you, you speak to them about it. We want to make sure that they've added any disabilities because we will recognize things that are, like you said, you know, a, a full disability as a service connected disability. We will treat it as such. And prosthetics does have stipulations in those laws stating that you either need to be service connected disability or be treated as service connected disability in the eligibility requirements. So definitely look at how that disability is documented in your record, because that will impact it. And then, you know, get, like Jane Ann said, social workers are a great source that we always encourage. They may be able to get you in touch with someone to make sure it's uh, documented properly in your medical record. So I don't let me know. Ask you, if, I, if I'm classified as catastrophically disabled, which gives me the same as 100% service related then why and and my disorder which is what everybody here has is documented in my records as catastrophically disabled and uh i have it, it's recorded as being treated as a hundred percent then why is it not possible to convert that to a presumptive disease in a manner that would fall in line with being catastrophically disabled. I know I'm not Larry, saying this Larry, right. If I, if I may, I, I'm going to suggest that we have to keep in mind that uh, Jane Ann and, and Dustin uh, are within the, the uh, prosthetics department and, and uh, uh, they may not have control over that determination. Okay, well, um, my, I guess my point was they base their ability to give on percent of disability in many cases, correct? That's yes, on these, that's I, on these me, specialty uh, programs. That's on these specialty me, programs. Yeah, let me touch right. on this. If, you, if your medical record states that you are catastrophically disabled, that's all well and good. If the VBAs, the VBAs, we go to their website because this is a VBA mm -hmm. benefit and we look at your registered disabilities, if the VBA has not registered that disability, it will not be considered as being treated by the VA. So make sure you reach out and get with your DAV and get that registered with the VBA because that's what we're looking at. We're not looking in your medical record. Prosthetics does not work in veterans' medical records per se. We wor work in a procurement, in literally an acquisitions program that shows Dustin, us consults. Dustin, if I may, we're, yep. we're running somewhat short of time and I know Suds has a question, yep. but may I give you a call later on this week and have you uh, maybe um, uh, elaborate a little bit more on that because that's exactly what we're trying to do is get yeah. our disease, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, recognized yeah. uh, by the uh, VBA. And, uh, you know, that, and that, might, that might help a lot of us. That's probably so, the hurdle you're coming across. Yes, absolutely. Feel free to give I'll myself give you, I'll give you a call. call. Yeah, I'll give you a call sometime this week, if I may. Uh, Thanks, Suds, you. You, had a, you had a question, Suds? Yeah, that, and, and my question was kind of going through the same thought process as Larry and some of the other guys, where the VBA doesn't recognize us, yet the health side does. And for most of us, they on the health side, you all look at us and say, you guys are disabled or you're catastrophically disabled. But yet when you go on the VBA, which is the topic that Jim is talking about, they look at us and go like, Nope. And thank you for your service. 
and that's no. about it. Yeah. Which is, that's, which that's is why we're all being denied disability benefits. Yeah, and that's I, yes. that's the frustrating part of of our mission is to <clears throat> help educate those people on the VBA side. We appreciate what you guys are doing, Dustin and Jane, for all of us. So, yeah. thank and, you very and much. again, um, maybe, um, and I'm just thinking out loud now. This is not something i've seen but like i said there is there is there are requirements um in all of our benefits programs that state if you're being treated and it's been accepted as a disability that you'll be treated as um maybe uh the route you go is not to be recognized for disability payments but start by just getting it to where they recognize it in your record at the vba as a disability you're being treated for and then that would open up the gate to a lot of the grants, but you, you know, just like as a first step. And then once you get the grants and stuff all, all bumped up, then move on to the actual disability. Payment. Interesting. Dustin, I'll, just I'll, as I'll, a if, yeah, if I may, I'll call you, I'll call you this week and we can, yep. you might be able to elaborate on that a little bit more. And uh, uh, I can share that with the, uh, the rest of the group here. Um, okay. We're at the uh, we're at the time limit here before uh, another group uh, needs the Zoom account, so um, we will conclude our meeting today. And uh, with with endless thanks, uh, Jane Ann and Russ Dustin, thank you endlessly for uh, uh, helping us out today and answering these questions and providing all the information. It's been highly informative, and I think we've gotten a lot of a lot of good benefit out of that. And we. We cannot thank you enough. Uh, I'm happy to do it. Yep, you're very uh, welcome. So I will be in touch. Uh, Jane, thank you for my wheelchair. Uh, and uh, uh, if it breaks, I'll call you. And, uh, <laughs> Please do. <laughs> so, That's usually how it works. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm still working on those fuzzy dice and the eight track tape. Yeah. Uh, for the yeah. wheelchair. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, again, thank you. Thank you so much. For helping us out today, it is uh, it, it is with uh, uh, endless gratitude that we uh, we we appreciate you being here. With that, no, I will no. conclude it. Thank you all for participating and visiting. We hope to see you next month. Anybody has any questions, email me, and we will proceed from there. Thank you, and and enjoy the rest of the weekend. All right, thank, thank you. you. Take care. And Real quick, Jim, I did throw in the Vision map just so you can kind of see the regional offices. It's that hyperlink I just put in the chat. If you're curious what region you fall in. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks, Dustin. Thanks, okay. Joanne. Thanks, you're Jim. Bye-bye. Mm, Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Yeah, I'm gonna, see you guys. Later. See you later. See you, everybody. Later, guys. Take care. Where I've got to stop the recording here. There we go.